Um, so we've called the display here at the minute uh, from the secret block to ROSC. So it, it kind of, um, I guess, the, the secret block for a secret person in Ireland and ROSC are two kind of exhibitions that Boyce participated in, um, which kind of bookend his, his time in Ireland. And um, at the center of our display, uh, the three blackboards that he created um, during a lecture that he gave in the gallery uh, in October 1974 uh, during the exhibition from the secret um, block for a secret person in Ireland. And I'm sure you all know and you discovered that Boyce was uh, one of the most influential European artists of the second half of the 20th century. Um, both through his teaching, I think, uh, his engagement with social and political concerns and also for his symbolic use of materials. Um, and he had a particular interest in the Celtic world and he saw Irish myth, literature and landscape as sources for cultural renewal. He was also a pioneer of performance art uh, or actions as he called them and addressed environmental concerns, which has already been mentioned. Um, very briefly, a bit of biography. He was born in Krefeld uh, in Germany and grew up in um, Cleves, uh, which is often described as a Celtic enclave. And um, during World War II, he joined the Luftwaffe. Uh, in 1944, his plane crashed in the Crimea and he constructed a myth, um, which I think is going to be, I think will resurface over the next few days as mythology is, is, is I guess, the theme of this, this kind of event. Um, and he constructed a myth that he'd been rescued by nomadic Tatars who wrapped him in felt and animal fat. And that story provided the origins, the kind of origin story for his unorthodox use of material. And his biography was very much intertwined with his art as he sought to explore or um, to kind of work through, I guess, the trauma of the conflict of the war and the post-war period and the potential for healing through creativity, which um, I think people have already said is, is needed again today. After the war, he studied at the Dusseldorf Academy of Fine Arts and he later taught at the school, but was dismissed after he insisted on free entry to his classes, uh, disregarding the institution's limit on student numbers. And actually his dismissal um, kind of enabled him, gave him the time to travel to, to, to Ireland with the, with the exhibition uh, and to, to give all the lectures which I'll um, go into shortly. Nonetheless, teaching remained an important part of his work. And uh, in 1973, he co-founded the Free International University for Creativity and Interdisciplinary Research. Um, we'll just call it the Free International University for short. And that promoted the idea that individuals should be free to realize their creative potential, which was one of the central tenets of his teaching. And attempts were made to establish Dublin as a base for the Free International University, although this wasn't uh, realized um, although it was instrumental, as I'll come to, in the formation of art and research exchange in Belfast uh, in the late 70s. And so in our exhibition on at the moment, we're showing um, Boyce's Dublin blackboards, which you see on screen there. Uh, for the first time with photographs by Caroline Tisdall uh, of Boyce's visit to or visits to Ireland in 1974. And Caroline Tisdall was then art critic for the Guardian newspaper. And she organized the secret block for the secret person in Ireland exhibition for the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford. And she accompanied Boyce on uh, his travels to uh, Dublin and Belfast and further afield around Ireland. Um, and in the seventies and eighties, she documented much of Boyce's work providing an important first-hand record uh, and here's some of the, the photos in the exhibition. So these are three photos of Boyce giving his lecture in Dublin, which we, we didn't have any archive material of other than the blackboards themselves. So um, I guess we've, we're acquiring these works by Caroline and the idea is that uh, you know, we'll have the photographs in the collection, which will kind of support the, um, uh, the, the blackboards, which are already in the collection. Um, and to try and provide a bit of context and maybe animate the blackboards a little bit. Um, and Boyce and Tisdall first met in 1973 at the Edinburgh Festival where Boyce gave a 12 hour lecture during an experimental summer school organized by Richard DeMarco. And 
Richard's, uh, Richard DeMarcus Gallery in Edinburgh hosted eight visits by Boyce to Scotland from 1970 onwards. And Boyce and DeMarco frequently collaborated um, in a, I guess, an ongoing exploration of, the, of what they kind of called the Celtic consciousness and their interest, shared interest in Irish and Scottish myth, landscape and culture was entwined with a broader interest in um, the Celtic world, the traces of which extend across Europe. Um, and I, I spoke with Richard DeMarco earlier in the year uh, and about his work with Boyce and that, that is on our YouTube channel. So you can look that up if, if you're interested. And DeMarco and Tisdall have been hugely important in the dissemination of Boyce's art and ideas in the UK and Ireland. Um, and through her friendship and collaboration with Boyce, Carolyn and Tisdall created an extraordinary photographic archive of the artist's work. Many of her photos have been published in books um, such as We Go This Way and um, the 1979 Guggenheim uh, exhibition catalogue. And also Coyote, a book called Coyote, which documented his, perhaps his most famous action, I Like America and America Likes Me, where he spent three days in a room uh, with a coyote in a gallery in New York. Um, some more works by Caroline. And actually her documentation, um, so Boyce had a kind of a presence, I guess, in Dublin in a way where his work did at numerous points throughout the, the um, 70s, 80s. I'm going to focus on 1974 when he gave the exhibition here, but um, the document, Caroline Tisdall's photographs of the Coyote performance um, were shown at the Project Gallery, Project Art Centre in 1978 as well. And he returned, uh, his work returned, well, he returned as well in uh, two Ross exhibitions, which I'll touch on briefly at the end. But I'll focus uh, on the 1974 exhibition. So the Hugh Lane Gallery exhibited the secret block for a secret person in Ireland in September and October 1974. As I said, it was organised by Caroline Tizzle for the, for the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford, and then it travelled to Edinburgh, London, Dublin and Belfast. And it was brought to Dublin by Oliver Dowling, who was working at the Arts Council at the time. Um, and I guess in that period, the Arts Council of Ireland actually brought or managed to organize a lot of exhibitions, particularly international exhibitions, uh, rather than, and then galleries would be kind of host, host them. Um, and uh, he worked with Ethan Waldron, who was a curator of the Hugh Lane Gallery uh, at the time. And that was the initial slide with a picture of Boyce, and that was Boyce and Ethan Waldron. Um, our, one, our one color photo of, of Boyce in Dublin. Um, the secret block for secret person Ireland, when it was shown here, comprised 266 drawings. You see one of them on the right here on the, on the private view card. Um, 266 drawings made between 1936 and 1972, which Boyce called thinking forms. And together, collectively, they, they formed what he called a block, a term he used for a group of work. Um, and even though they're drawing, I think it's a term that also has kind of sculptural connotations, you think of the sort of physical, the physical space that they might occupy. And there was secret in that they'd, um, they'd never been exhibited previously. And I get and a secret per block for a secret person, this idea that they uh, were kind of codes maybe to secret knowledge that you could um, unravel. And the group of drawings actually evolved and grew um, to a much larger group of 456 drawings in the coming years. He didn't create the secret block with Ireland in mind. It was only after the exhibition was planned to come to Dublin uh, that um, in Ireland was added. Um, and um, it's the secret person is sometimes interpreted as James Joyce. Um, and I guess he saw, I guess he was very happy to visit and, and kind of was embraced when Oliver Dowling extended the exhibition for the um, exhibition to come to Dublin. He, Boyce embraced the idea, as I said, he had a long-standing interest in kind of Irish myth and literature. Um, and he saw Ireland as a place where the, the invisible kind of creative energies hadn't been completely erased by, by um, its industrialization and, and modernization. And um, perhaps uh, criticized perhaps a little bit for a slightly romantic view of Ireland. But, um, and actually, 
I don't have an image of it, but uh, the, the first book you'll encounter if you, you do come to the gallery is a photograph of Boyce drawing um, a work called The Brain of Europe, another blackboard. So he's drawing a, a diagram uh, with a kind of map of Ireland, um, which he called The Brain of Europe, with a range of political positions. Um, and actually that circle, that's kind of circle of um, different political positions on the island of Ireland, uh, was originally drawn for him by Carolyn Tisdall uh, to, to kind of explain, I guess, some of the context that he might be working in. And then he took that diagram and, and reworked it uh, as, a, as a blackboard himself. Um, and it formed the center of um, half one at the Ron Feldman Gallery in New York in 1975. And he optimistically expressed a range of positions in Northern Ireland as unity in diversity. Um, and he saw when he was uh, in Northern Ireland, he visited the Giants Causeway and he saw um, the metaphor of university, sorry, unity in diversity as physically represented in the basalt columns. Um, they're all these kind of, you know, individual columns, but, but together they kind of form this kind of collective whole. So he saw that as a kind of metaphor for this idea of, you know, unity and diversity. Um, oh, and that's, that's Boyce and Esther Waldron um, in the gallery. And it's interesting, very little, I mean, perhaps the drawings that were shown were, um, perhaps unlike a lot of other drawings that maybe were being shown here at the time, they're kind of tentative, they're um, a range of media materials, um, Sometimes they may be piemonic scribbles or notes. Um, they're kind of uh, not maybe the most easily kind of understood. Uh, and if you're kind of maybe more used to conventional drawing. Um, so perhaps the drawings themselves wouldn't appear to the, the media, but I think we'll touch on this and I'm sure you'll come back to it. The, the uh, Boyce's persona um, and his image was very strong and almost all of the press coverage, in fact, all of the press coverage um, figures Boyce and the face and the image of Boyce, the man, rather than the work, um, as you can see here on, on some of the, the press cuttings. And this was the poster, uh, and just kind of to reinforce that point, this is the poster for the exhibition uh, in Dublin. It was the same poster used in, uh, in Oxford and then kind of overprinted. Um, and he used posters, postcards, and other media to expand the reach of his work. And it shows Boyce, again, the, 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 the figure of the artist, not his face this time, but his hands uh, leaning over a table with a pencil, a pencil in hand. And he was often depicted in his exhibition posters, helping to create a strong public image of the artist. And he frequently signed them. Uh, and he once said, whenever I sign my name, I am drawing. And you can see the signature. Perhaps you can make out the signature at the bottom. Uh, of that. So the exhibition had mixed reviews in Dublin. Um, in the Irish Times, Brian Fallon called Boyce a serious artist with a wide range of techniques and a striking flow of wit and invention. He did praise the drawings, but concluded, well, he was an artist of obvious and fertile talent. He is scarcely a major one. Um, I think probably history is perhaps um, taking a different view, but um, the Evening Herald reported on a lovely piece of hokum and called the drawings trivial, derivative, and undistinguished, and parodied the perceived intellectualism of the artist. Um, others in the Herald and the Independent were just simply baffled by the exhibition. But alongside the exhibition, um, there were a series of lectures. And uh, in September, uh, close to the start of the exhibition, he gave lectures in Limerick and in Cork uh, at the Crawford Art Gallery and at the City Library and Art Gallery in Limerick. Uh, and then he returned to Dublin uh, during the run of the exhibition in October and gave a lecture here. And um, the blackboards from Limerick and Cork don't survive, um, although particularly the Crawford lecture has created a kind of lot of stories and mythologies about what happened to the blackboards uh, and other artists have, have um, Sean Lynch and Danny McCarthy have made works around kind of what happened in the aftermath of the um, of those lectures. So even though the blackboard survived, the kind of the stories and the mythology around the, the events do. Um, and that's one of Caroline's photos of, of the court lecture. 
and the lectures themselves um, generated considerable, perhaps more media attention than the um, uh, the exhibition, particularly um, focusing on the ideas of the Free International University, this is the Irish Examiner, um, that Boyce wanted to kind of extend uh, or embrace kind of creativity in everyday life and the idea that um, everyone had a kind of a creative side that, that should be kind of unleashed. And during these events, Boyce wrote and drew on blackboards, expanding on his thinking in ways that the drawings could not. And in an interview with, the Her with Harriet Cook in the Irish Times, when he was in Dublin, he said um, that from 1970, the drawings uh, are like on, on blackboards, um, became increasingly important. He said, the stress lies more and more in my lectures and discussions because I now feel as necessity not to change the appearance and the characters of art, like innovations in the art histori historian line, that it's necessary to change art itself. And he began using the blackboards first in the 1960s, but uh, from 1970 onwards there, they begin to play a bigger role. And um, for the lecture in Dublin, he actually used blackboards from two neighboring schools, uh, from Colossia, we're right next door to us, and Belvedere College, I think. Um, so obviously, you know, art galleries aren't in the habit of having sort of blackboards lying around. Um, so they borrowed them from the schools and then replacement blackboards were um, bought for the schools so that the works could um, uh, be given to the gallery by the artist. Um, and very often uh, his, his blackboards from lectures attained the status of artworks after the event and Boyce signed the, black the backs of these three blackboards. Um, they can be difficult to decipher perhaps after the event um, because you know, these are kind of in a sense teaching aids. Um, so he's, you know, he's kind of expanding on the ideas represented in the boards, um, but our boards and consistent with others as well uh, do contain a lot of terms and motifs that are, reflect Boyce's thinking. Terms such as freedom uh, in the top left, I don't know if you can read these, creativity, art, science, uh, equality, brotherhood, socialism, um, central bank, which is an intriguing one. Um, and uh, on this one, there's a large kind of diagram on the right of the sun with the word sun state. Uh, and that's also found in, a, in other works such as this uh, blackboard created in Chicago. Um, so it's the idea of the sun state, it's a kind of uh, astrological chart in this drawing embodying ideas um, of the ideal state in which democratic principles inform cultural life. And on our third blackboard, the um, this kind of uh, sketch at the bottom with the kind of spiral eyes has been interpreted as a portrait of the writer James Joyce, who's also interpreted as the secret person in Ireland in the exhibition title. Um, move on. Just quickly, so we've got alongside um, the photos from the, the performance and the exhibition itself, we've also acquiring uh, works by photographs by Caroline just to show um, a little more of Boyce's interest in, in Ireland and his travels here because uh, he also visited sites of particular interest um, with um, in the top image there top left you see Boyce visiting Sandy Cove which is of course the setting for the opening sequence of Joyce's Ulysses um, and as I mentioned Boyce had a particular interest in Joyce and particularly his experimentation with language and later on, actually, Joyce, um, sorry, Boyce, um, responded to Joyce's Ulysses uh, by producing um, six notebooks containing uh, hundreds of drawings, which he kind of envisaged as an extension of kind of further chapters to, uh, to Ulysses. Um, and they're now in, in Darmstadt and currently on display. There was a plan in 1977 that these would be shown at the Joyce Museum in Sandy Cove, but the works are too fragile to travel. Um, 
Boyce also visited Newgrange with uh, Cecil King, the artist whose work we also have in display at the moment, and with Oliver Darling of the Arts Council. Um, and Boyce believed the carvings he saw at Newgrange uh, were evidence that the ancient Celts had a sophisticated knowledge of physical and spiritual energies. And this idea of energy, creative, physical and spiritual is present throughout much of um, Boyce's work and perhaps informed his unorthodox use of material. And on the bottom left there, you see um, some of his Irish energy. So when he was in Ireland, he, he simply sandwiched, he took peat briquettes and sandwiched them with uh, Kerrygold butter, kind of two, I guess, iconic kind of um, Irish products. And the one on the left is, is coal and butter sandwiched. So coal and peat briquettes sandwiched with butter. He, um, he had particular interest in environmental issues and uh, was a co-founder of the of the Green Party in Germany and was particularly attracted to um, to fossil fuels and to the to the bogs in of Ireland, um, which he was interested in their the, I guess, the creation of the kind of vast timescales. Um, and I think these, I mean, they were kind of I think initially made kind of slightly impromptu. Um, but it's interesting looking at them now, thinking about the kind of climate emergency um, and the, the the ending of the commercial um, kind of harvesting of peach for for peat briquettes. Um, it gives them, you know, perhaps a new a new context in, in which to view them. On the right there, which you have a yeah, this image here is Boyce visiting uh, the Royal Hospital Kilmainham, which perhaps you know as Emma today, um, and. The Royal Hospital was proposed as a potential site for the Free International University. So he had founded that with um, the writer Heinrich Bohl and a fellow artist, Klaus Steig, um, and Georg Meistermann and the journalist Willy Bongard. Um, again, to promote this idea that uh, people should be free to realize their creative potential. And in Ireland, um, Dorothy Walker, you can see an article there from Hibernia magazine, uh, Dorothy Walker, the art critic, was um, really engaged in trying to uh, establish the Free International University campus in Dublin. And she worked very hard and was a, a very strong advocate um, for that, for the founding of the County University in Dublin, which I think uh, just simply didn't happen because of um, lack of funding, it's often the way. Um, but temporary presentations of the FIU took place at Documenta and Castle in Germany, uh, at the Edinburgh Festival in London, New York and elsewhere. And a number of artists from Northern Ireland participated at uh, the FIU at Documenta in 1977. This then led to the formation of Art and Research Exchange, founded by Belinda Loftus, Alastair McLennan and Raina Pagel. And Art and Research Exchange in turn facilitated um, the establishment of the Artists Collective of Northern Ireland and Circuit Contemporary Art Magazine. So even though the campus didn't um, happen, uh, it, it was kind of part of a chain of events, I guess. Um, and quickly, just to touch on Northern Ireland, I realize it's half past 10 now, but um, so after the show in Dublin, uh, the Secret Block exhibition travelled to the Elster Museum in uh, in Belfast. It was first intended actually to go to the Arts Council Gallery, but there had been a bombing in that street, so it was switched to um, to the Elster Museum. Um, and the lecture and discussion held there uh, in November 1974 was, was really well documented, both um, by uh, television crews. And I think you're going to watch the video by... Um, Derek Bailey of Boyce's time in Northern Ireland. So I'll maybe kind of skip over this a little briefly because that gives a pretty good account of, um, of his, his time in, in Belfast. Um, and it was also extensively documented by the Ulster Museum photographer, Bill Porter. Um, and the four blackboards from that event were also donated to the Ulster Museum. So we've, we've blackboards both in Dublin and Belfast. Um, and again, you see key phrases, you see um, the diagram, diagram of the earth, um, with the kind of rays of the sun, uh, a figure, um, and uh, terms such as freedom, art, brotherhood, love, socialism, and the three spirals that you see up on the top left, uh, sorry, top right uh, blackboard were derived from uh, a carving 
at Newgrange that he visited um, earlier in the year. His, um, I think the lecture here uh, was in Dublin was attended maybe by about 30 or 40 people just from kind of anecdotal evidence. Um, the artist Brian Maguire has spoken about that and um, particularly influenced by Boyce's kind of work in prisons. Um, but the, the lecture in um, Belfast had a much bigger audience. I think they bust in actually people from different kind of community groups to try and guarantee an audience. And you can also see the exhibition. So the exhibition was hung um, quite simply just some kind of um, clip frames uh, just these hundreds of drawings that you can see them a little bit behind the behind the blackboards, um, and in the the television documentary um, by Derek Bailey, one woman he meets in the street tells Boyce he's picking over Ulster's bones. That's all you are doing, picking the carcass. So um, he had quite an impact there, uh, both negative and positive. Um, and the artist John Carson later wrote. Um, and he actually put together these uh, student magazine kind of um, summaries of Boyce's visit to, to Belfast, which capture, it's, it's satirical, but it captures some of the different kind of responses. Um, Car John Carson later wrote that this woman in the street was not the only one to throw such accusations in the face of the publicity circus surrounding Boyce's visit to, quote, our troubled province. Um, so there was some uh, kind of uh, pushing back against his, his visit, but uh, and while, as you see here, it was satirized in student publications, other students, and you'll see them in the film, um, really responded, who felt that he was, for the first time, unlike their lecturers, was, was talking about the kind of social and political context in which they were working. Um, and one of the students, Brendan Watson, uh, wrote in the um, Arts of Ireland, a kind of defense of Boyce's visit and praised the artist's demonstration for the necess necessity for genuine purposeful dialogue about our um, social problems. And just quickly, coming back to Dublin in uh, 1977, um, so the works were acquired by the gallery, they were given by the artist after the close of the exhibition, they went into store. The acquisition itself was not problematic or controversial, um, it seems. Uh, but three years later, Ethna Waldron put the works on display for the first time since the lecture. And um, the ensuing debate as to their status as artworks generated considerable coverage in the newspapers. The um, Cultural Advisory Committee for the Council, of which we're part, recommended the blackboards be removed. But the city manager, J.B. Malloy, backed the curator and the works were allowed to stay on display until the 1977 uh, Ross exhibition. And you can just see some of the kind of newspaper headlines. You know, it's, it's not art, it's a, it's a practical joke. Um, and a debate followed in the, in the press as to whether they were just scribbles or a fine example of conceptual art. Um, and they were taken down, as I said, for uh, Rosk 1977. So that was a series of exhibitions of contemporary art, international contemporary art that took place in Dublin from 67 to 88. And the 1977 exhibition was held here in the Hugh Lane Gallery. Um, and he showed fat up to this level uh, there on the right. And um, two, the two Irish energies works that were featured in a, the, the, the peat briquette sandwich of butter, two of those um, that were in Caroline's uh, photo earlier on were actually shown in the Bank of Ireland, um, which strikes me as most kind of incongruous and unlikely um, uh, setting to show these kind of works, but the Bank of Ireland was the, the sponsor for the exhibition. So these, these strange voice objects were, were shown there in 1977 as part of, as part of Rosk as well. And uh, Boyce returned um, again to Dublin in 1984 um, for another show of his drawings at the Guinness uh, Visitor Centre for Ross. Um, at the end, reflecting, Dorothy Walker, who I mentioned, was a strong advocate for Boyce in, uh, in Dublin. She, I'll just leave you with a, kind of a quote from her, I guess, as to why the blackboards were kept and she concluded that while they're difficult, or they can be difficult to decipher, um, one is convinced that this is art 
and that an irresistible new world is being disclosed. It is often bathed in mystery. One may have no idea what it's about, but one has absolute faith that it is art. So that is why we keep the blackboards, which we've done. And uh, yeah, they'll be on display here along with the photographs until um, November.